<clears throat> Secondly, I've had a few questions since I, because uh, I we figured the test date in the first group at uh, in the morning, and so I figured to use the same test date here, and so I sent the study guide. And what I do in additional to that is I record, I sort of narrate an additional guide as I look at the questions. So I'll look at the test, and and as I look at it, I'll highlight it. And see what's on there. So it's going to be an answer to your, your question and many others the same question. What format? It's going to be maybe 60 to 65 short multiple choice questions. It's objective. Scantron, number two pencils, all that good stuff. So multiple choice, true, false, matching, da -da. that's the nature of the test. Uh, I do that for a significant reason. I mean, there's you. I'm sure you have ample instructors do short answers and essays. And it's one of the reasons I don't do homework. Uh, is I, you're in college. I mean, you, 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 to me, homework is like work product. A lot. I understand instructors find it to be valuable. I'm trying to prepare most of you to take some kind of a licensure exam in the comparatively near future, which if you do not pass, it makes a lot of time and money. You could be doing other things out alternatively to getting this kind of an education. I'm not, not knocking it at all or anything like that. But uh, I mean, to me, that's everything. Licensure fields and the, and the exams are not, well, I can explain to you how much. It doesn't work that way. They have to have some type of criteria to compare you to the other thousands of individuals who are taking the exam on the same day to get a, arbitrarily a nursing license in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So that's the way it works. You versus the computer. They're objective. You give you the question, you get the responses, you click and you keep it. There's no way to cheat. They go through a metal detector. They scan you if you go off. That's it. You're in a giant room, partitioned, you know, and nobody has silence and you versus the computer. And then when at some juncture, when you answer questions, all of a sudden they kick you off. And you have, it just says you're done. You have no idea whether you're done good or done bad. That's why I try to do it this way. So I make the exams to some extent rigorous and challenging to prepare you better for ones that I hope are not quite as rigorous or challenging. And then I adjust the grades accordingly because I have an idea what, 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 with what you do on one of my tests, how it translates to the kind of grade that you would typically receive maybe from somebody else. It's the best way I can express it. Not only, I've been doing it with nursing students and other health professional students, medical students, for you know, a quarter of a century, which is I, I it has, there's a certain time element that's about that. As well. That and the, the twelfth is my eldest birthday. He'll be oh, this is hard. Forty one. And again, not they all looked at me. There was no astonishment. There was no oh my god, you couldn't have a forty one year old kid. No, you all would be like, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> So that's, that, does that answer your question, everybody, about what's going on? So I narrated based on the questions. So here, here are the tools. The, the study guide, sure, that, 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 those are fairly generic. This is on your Blackboard. This is a supplement. It says micro chapter three supplements on week one. Basically, the chapter we just completed and maybe even a little bit of what we're doing today, plus some stuff that's relevant for lab. And I wrote this from basically the same publisher's textbook. Uh, an early edition of the Nestor textbook, oh, I don't know, 20 plus years ago. So, and it still is relevant today. So this ends and ends is poor information. So, and that's about where we end, and that's kind of what we typically the last. Then, additionally, the other thing, when we get to the next section, which is really how they grow, and it's, it's really a very relevant chapter. And I took that, and so here's, some of this again is lab. You'll do streak plates and things like that in lab. But it talks about temperature levels and oxygen requirements, a little bit of what I kind of put on the board, even though it's relevant to something else today. Toxic derivatives of oxygen, that's what I put on the board. These are all things that you'll see in something called the bacterial growth curve, way down at the bottom, though in the textbook it typically comes in the beginning, is extraordinarily important. Because it really gives an understanding of, we have to study them in the lab to understand what they do inside of us. It's not the same environment, but it's the best way we can duplicate it. You don't want to make somebody electively sick. Well, let me give you this infection and we'll see how you, you do day one, day two, and day three. We'll, then we'll figure out how to treat you. 
can't do it that way. So that, I mean, so these are resources that are there. The study guide, the narrated study guide, every, every, every lecture recorded to, depending on how much time you want, I realize your time is relatively speaking precious and we're getting to that point and, that's, and exams always come because we all do the same thing. Most people get three or four exams. You generally end up with a week. It's like, oh my God. Right? I mean, I, hey, I've been in school forever in some way, shape, or form. So I'm just telling, I'm, uh, maybe I'm restating the obvious, but let us begin with today's information. So more about that. Once I look at the test, I'll give you an idea of the uh, the breakdown of the questions. Yeah, for sure, that gram positive, gram negative, endospore stuff, plasmids, the nucleus, the ribosomes, you know, run, tumble, run, all, all important stuff in there. So if you're going to, believe me, that would be the, the chapter I would certainly focus on the most by far. So we begin. So this is in your textbook. This is chapter four which deals, and today we're just going to try to cover the, and complete, where we'll have a, a couple of days, about well, Friday, and a couple of days next week to probably finish the growth. We'll probably have that finished by Wednesday, I would think. So it's comparatively fresher. So eukaryotic cells are like our cell. So we're going to deal with the microbial eukaryotic cells. The interesting part about that is this sort of common ancestor and the evolution and this is what endosymbiotic theory is, meaning that the cells with membrane-bound organelles probably started as similar to bacteria or single-cell entities that gobbled up and or were invaded by another single-celled entity, and rather than destroy it, found that it was beneficial. And so it became incorporated and subsequently became a... a developed a significant role in both effectively the ancestors evolutionarily of our animals today like us or plants today and those and we the evidence of this is called endosymbiotic theory it is more relevant to evolution than a lot of darwin had the right idea he understood it his his information are, are either galapagos and the changes as those islands were created and separated and change, quote unquote, change the environment and the adaptations was certainly correct. But there, it's not, it's not something that would typically you could duplicate and evaluate and, and stand the test of time. This theory does, but we see this consistently. What is the significant part about this? Is in our cells, animals, we have mitochondria. In plants, they have mitochondria, and they have chloroplasts. Those are bacterial in, ingested preserved, incorporated bacterial cell-like entities because they have that single circle of DNA that bacteria have, and they have 70S ribosomes like bacteria, and they're a pigmented and non-pigmented bacteria. That accounts for the chlorophyll, and they are all about energy transformations and energy production, and we can make more of them when we need them. If that's a mitochondria in your cell, and all of a sudden, your New Year's resolution, I got to go to the gym and work out more. And you start doing that and your muscles start getting built up. They're going to make more mitochondria. Okay, They're going to get bigger and they're going to need more mitochondria so they can reproduce. It's got its own DNA. It's got its own ribosomes. It'll do more energy transfer. And all of a sudden, you worked out so much. Oh, my! I, I, I really hurt myself. The, the doctor told me to take two or three weeks off. Now, all of a sudden, those guys disappear because you're not using it anymore. But, you know, when you get better, you go back and start again, they'll come back. Maybe you'll just have a little bit better. You're not trained like one of my, my stepson did. He just ran the mar marathon here in Pittsburgh without training. Messed up his knee for a year. Not brilliant. Just saying. Why well, anybody would run 26 miles anyway to come back to the starting point? I have a, it's a, the one is going to be for you. He's run like six marathons. I think he's running Pittsburgh. I just, I, I take out my car keys and go, here, go ahead. Bring it back in 26 miles if you feel like going. Right. So, and, and, and they're talking a little bit here about 
these were the primitive eukaryotes, cells with membrane-bound organelles, because inherently that had a membrane that ended a symbiotic entity. And they aggregated and became multicellular like we are, like plants are, and somewhat specialized and to a certain degree of complexity. Okay, and so these complexities evolved as individual cells lost the ability to some extent to survive separate. So that's why if we would shed, like we shed a cell, we definitely shed cells to die. But if you do a mouth swab and you have some of the cells from your lining in the mouth and you put them on a slide, as soon as it dries out, they're going to die. They can't survive outside of the environment. So we're once, I mean, so we're looking at the circular chromosomes and the 70S ribosomes, the fact that they could do independent, the, the membrane inhibited by antibiotics, I don't think is a particularly good choice that's there. So this is another example of evolutionary uh, symbol in eukarya versus prokarya. You remember, I, we talked a little bit about polar and lophotrichus and peritrichus flagella, but I made the point the flagella are considerably smaller and thinner and they're made of a protein, a repeat unit of protein called flagellin, F-L-A-G-E-L-L-I-N. And they're not in the membrane, they're not in the cell, they protrude like a hair and protrude out of your skin. This is an example of a eukaryotic flagella, for instance. These are made of microtubules, different. They're made out of something called tubulin, and it's not a chain, but it's circles that form tubes with a hollow center. And you'll surely remember this from A&P, this, these have, this is the famous nine plus two, nine doublets plus two in the middle. And we see that from flagella in little things in pond water, which are comparatively ancient, and in flagella in a sperm cell. Okay, and, and also they're inside the membrane, they're inside the cell, but they're pushing out against the membrane. That's the beauty of certain kinds of cell. The membrane is so flexible and fluid, it can form like a, like a sheath around that projection. And cilia are the same thing. They're just smaller and more abundant. And we use those a lot for moving, principally for moving mucus around in our respiratory. And as you will see, if you didn't have AP2 yet, some of you did, in our reproductive tracts. So there's, there's, you know, we understand these things, but evolutionarily, we see that, and indeed we classify some of those simple pond water organisms by how they move around, whether they are ciliated, whether they have flagella, whether they spin, whether they use amoeboid motion. And that's, that's it. And we'll, we'll look more about that when we get to the specific examples, which we probably will not get to today. So the eukaryotic flagella, thicker, the complexity is there with that nine plus two, covered in membrane, regularly spaced microtubules, that, that arrangement where the cilia, very similar, but smaller and more of them. And we really don't see them, okay? Cilia you only see in limited protozoan and, and area and our cells that are, again, reproductive and respiratory. So they're, they're interesting in that regard. There are no cilia in bacteria. Cilia's appendages are flagella, even though the name is the same, obviously structured differently, pili, different protein, different structure, fimbriae, different protein, different structure. Eukaryotic cells have flagella and cilia, they're both made of microtubules and the difference is the size and the abundance. Voila. Glycocalyx, eukaryotic cells have it. Polysaccharide, very similar to bacteria, a lot of sugars, okay, it can look fibrous, it can be a slime layer like bacteria. It can be a capsule like bacteria. And, and so there's nothing unusual about that, that thing. And there's so much to it. Again, for those who already had AP2, the, that sugar appendages are really what make our ABO blood system, our blood grouping blood system, come from short chain carbohydrates that protrude from red cells. And that's a unit. If you haven't done AP2, you will do it. Okay. And so they play a lot of important roles. So they're, they're, there's, there's similarities and there's differences. They're still living cells. This is how they interact with the environment, whether they receive signals, whether they stick to things, all that type of stuff. 
the ones that don't have cell walls are limited to protozoans, the ones that are just very much similar, very tiny, single cell, kind of act like animal cells, where we're multicellular, okay? And we really don't do the helminths, but they're similar to, you know, that's the worms and they're early, you know, the microscopic where they get together. Whereas the ones that have cell wall are either algae or the family of yeast and fungi and bulbs. So what do the cell walls provide? Support and shape. Chemical composition certainly different from bacteria and archaea. Okay, the big player in many kinds of fungi is chitin. Again, you remember me talking about chitin? Insects, lobster, shrimp. The shell is on the outside. We call it a chitinous exoskeleton. Their support system is on the outside, not on the inside. So, but chitin, again, is that real stiff, basically inedible, erroneously referred to as fibrous part of like a mushroom stem that we see a lot. So, you know, depending on what you're working with, a lot of times you remove the stems or you use them for another purpose, but not for you. Okay. So we have boundary structures and in the eukaryotic world, they can be with or without cell walls. That's what this is about. And you take a look at it here. You can see here's the membrane. As you go away from it, this is the direction going away from top to bottom, chitin, glycoproteins, glycans, those are those carbohydrates that with nitrogen, glycocalyx, mostly other kinds of carbohydrates. So it's, it's fairly elaborate, depending on the organism, but not a big deal for us. Code, if I say not a big deal for us, I'm not gonna ask you a test question. See? So if you guys are studying together, it's like, he said not a big deal for us, ignore it. Phospholipid bilayers, universal for eukaryotic cells. Semi-permeable, embedded proteins, fluid mosaic model. I'm sure you're sick about hearing already. Okay. What imparts stability in both cells that have cells, but those that have cell walls like plants and those that do not like protozoans, sterile. Sterols, and the name is similar to the sterol that's in our cells, cholesterol. Animal cells all have cholesterol. That is the stability. The, st the cholesterol imparts stability and to some degree flexibility in our cells so they can change shape and not become a particular problem. Okay. Plants have sterols. A lot of times, the old, if you're into health science in, in the sense of foods to eat that are healthy, they'll say this is this plant is rich in sterols that produce certain benefits. I mean, there's a lot of good fatty stuff that's in there, whether it's the fat soluble vitamins, which are A, D, and K. I mean, uh, my vitamin D level looks a little, a little low, so I saw my doctor last week. He goes, "You're going to pump up the vitamin D," so I am. You know, vitamin D is it's it's good not to be on the low. I was still in the normal range toward the bottom and that's not necessarily a great place and so that's part of it as well so and the, the membranes act the same way selectively permeable what's interesting in fungi and when we talk about yeast and protozoan and fungal infections are big players in this place. so yeast have this sterol looks like cholesterol but not the same similar the sterol nucleus is the chemical structure called ergo or gastrol. That's the target for any antifungal cream, liquid, tablet, medicine by injection. That's the modern target. There were other targets when we look at antifungals today and historically down the road. So a lot of them point. So if you go get antifungal cream because you have athlete's foot or something on your skin and the doctor said, hey, go get that. You know, that's, that's the way it works. This is, you've had this enough times. We're not going to go crazy. The main, we used to, that's where the name carrion came from. The most prominent invisible organelle, the nucleus. Bacteria have a nucleoid. Okay. 
they have an envelope. The envelope has got two parallel membranes. It's got little pores called nuclear pores. That's how things transit in and out. Materials transiting in so we can assemble DNA and RNA. RNA can transit out like messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA. But DNA is too big. So, I, you know, it's always like the little door you have in your house with the dog and cat. You ever see the house with a little cat door? We have a big dog. We don't have a cat door. We used to. To go down to the litter box in the basement in our older house. This 150 pound golden couldn't get through the door, but the kitties could. At one point, we had eight. Yes. Two dogs, eight cats, an iguana, a couple of rabbits. Oh, help me. So, what do you got now? Uh, two cats, one dog. Seems very big dog. Irish dude. I have a picture. Picture? Yeah. These guys have seen, I do, I do dog and cat pictures and children pictures. And mostly grandchildren pictures because they're cute. Yeah. Ah, ah. I'm doing it here. Usually we have a picture of the day. Wrong one. Okay. Real quick, because we have, we, in the interest of time, we're doing this fast. In the interest of time, we have the recordings. Send it, baby. Make me, there it is. There he is. He is a big dog. 75 pounds of puppy. Lincoln. Well, he's going to be three. He acts like a puppy. What could be cuter? You guys have seen the dog before. He takes me for a walk. This is, this, see, I, he's somewhere in the freaking Mediterranean. He's texting me. What kind of dog was Trudy? I can't remember. But I have to remember. He's, he's excused. He was like four. Springers, we had his and her Springer Spaniels. This is part of the reason you don't want to have children. They're constantly bugging you. Moving back. Okay, so we don't have to spend a whole lot of time rebuilding the wheel or revisiting the nucleus. That's for sure. Okay, enough. So all that macromolecules. Test question. Everybody write it down. Where where is ribosomal RNA made? The nucleolus. We always, we have at least one with every nucleus. Maybe two. Maybe more. Okay. Where is ribosomal RNA made? The nucleolus. I've never seen a test where we talk about the nucleolus where that is in the test question. So everybody gets at least one right. For some of you, that's advantageous. Chromatin. While you're writing down the RNA synthesis, the our ribosomal RNA. Pro, remember, we uh, the bacteria have the nucleoid. It's already supercoiled, so it's somewhat visible. We have chromatin in eukaryotic cells, like our cells, when the cell is not going to reproduce. When it reproduces, it supercoils, and we see the chromosomes when we start when we start mitosis or meiosis. You should remember that from you know earlier classes. What holds it, and you can see the name, it's called histone proteins. The analogy for DNA is like a spring. Okay, the better now. I mean, so if springs, their natural tendency is to supercoil. If you stick something in between the spring part of it and stretch it, it doesn't, it resists supercoiling, and so it isn't as visible, and it looks like little threads or just sort of an amorphous stain, a stain that doesn't have any shape. So my best analogy for that is an old toy that used, now is in plastic, but used to come in metal when I had one. 
Slinky. If you know a Slinky, see? So, you know, you're like, Mom, I broke the Slinky. Well, stop sticking stuff in it. And you stretched it out or it got tangled. Down the steps, up the steps. Slinky. So that's kind of what it looks like. Here's nuclear pores. Nothing special. Endoplasmic reticulum rough and smooth. That's eukaryotic cells. Effectively, this is all part of the endomembrane system from the nuclear membrane all the way to the cell membrane to transport materials that are either going to be bound in membrane in the cell, like lysosomes and peroxisomes, or go out and be part of the cell membrane or be spit out or exocytosed. It's one of three things. When you guys get the new nursing students, I'm doing all the AP1 lectures. Oh, I just found out. The same lecture three times a day. I just go on automatic pilot. <laughs> Dr. Robbins is doing all the labs. He's decided to take over the lab. He's not happy with the way the labs are being done. Good for him. Good idea. Like Pardon me? I said... That he does. He's he's. he's you're not. He's, thankfully, you'll be done with it. He he. It's good to have change. The problem is, for years, we've always had adjuncts, and a lot of these adjuncts would. Come, and I'm not just naming names. We've had adjuncts who've run a lab, come in, sent a two and a half hour lab, and spent thirty minutes and goodbye. And they're getting paid, and, and they're not doing. And it's very inconsistent. So uh, Dr. Robbins wants to do, wants to make it very consistent. And with me doing the, the lecture and him doing the labs, you know, we'll be in concert together, I think, for the, for the new group. Uh, uh, change is good. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, I'm not, you know, he couldn't be a, a, a more talented and nicer man. Moving on. So the Golgi, nothing new about that. To me, that's the packing and shipping department in the cell. Stuff comes in, we repackage it, stuff goes out. It's got different things called cis and trans sites. All that means is that trans are coming in and cis are going out. And you'll see the example here. So trans, they, you know, this is that, where they're transitioning from the endoplasmic to the Golgi. And cis is when they're going out, having been condensed or formed. Again, not something I do that more with my advanced students that are there because you really don't. This is not stuff that's a great deal. Part of it, yes, it's an assembly line, nothing special here. And anything that's made with proteins, again, they have three destinations they can be inside the cell, they can be spit out, or they can be part of the membrane. That's the ones that are in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All the other proteins are made in these free ribosomes. So the things that are making those microtubules, free ribosomes, okay, microfilaments, free ribosomes. And then there are two kinds, and that's why I wrote up here a little bit. There are two kinds of significant uh, interior vesicles that stay in the cell. Lysosome is for digestion and defense. So anything that you ingest. So if you eat something, it goes, it gets, basically gets inside one of your cells. And it interacts with all the lysosomes, even in your defense systems. You know, they latch onto a virus or a bacteria. When it comes onto the cell, it gets paste in membrane because it protects the rest of the cell. And it junks with the lysosome, which is filled with nasty enzymes for digestion or defense. If it's food, it'll digest it and we use it. If it's a bacteria, virus, a toxin, it'll gobble it up and destroy it. So that's the role that they play. The big problem with lysosomes is when you cut or hurt yourself, it spills out, and those enzymes are nasty. They hurt. And then when they signal inflammation, that's part of what you feel pain from an injury or an accident when you twist an ankle or you cut your finger in the kitchen. It's when lysosomal enzymes are coming out. The big problem with lysosomes genetically, they're a lysosomal storage disorder, which I'm sure you heard about in EP1, such as Tay Sachs disease, the most famous. We're basically you can't get rid of the debris that accumulates in the cell. Now, unfortunately, affects very young children who typically don't live in the nest. 
That was one of the earliest genetic tests. My first wife and I in 1980 had a blood test because it's frequently found as autosomal recessive. So if you're both recessive, you want to be And Ashkenazi Jewish people, which we are here, Jewish background. So our answers are okay when they go. But nevertheless, the peroxisome is an odd ball. They don't even have it here. Peroxisomes are super important. We find them, and we're going to get to this in the next chapter, in cells that have aerobic capability. They're in our, all of our cells because we're, we're aerobic. We're, we, we are mandatory aerobes. We're obligate. We have to have oxygen supply. So we need air in order to do oxygenated air in order to do metabolism. Where you'll see with bacteria, some have the capability, some do not. They don't have the peroxisomes, but they have some of these chemicals incorporated that are made. Our peroxisomes, and we carry out of the aerobic peroxisomes, have these two. Superoxide dismutase, we always use two hard The other one's called catalase, and you will use the catalase in the lab as a way to determine whether a bacteria that you're testing is aerobic or anaerobic. It's the main test to distinguish between staphylococcus. Oxygen, what oxygen's role is in life, good old O2, is called the terminal electron acceptor. Its whole purpose in metabolism, why we breathe it, why we have to require so much, why we have an immense amount of hemoglobin in our blood, is it sucks up electrons. See, when you and I do energy transformation, basically we ingest something to eat. It's filled with chemical bonds, most of those wonderful non-polar covalent bonds. The bonds require energy to hold the units together. We break them, we extract the energy, okay, and, we're, and we use the other parts of the building blocks to make carbon dioxide. But what are we left with? A bunch of electrons. We have to have parking place. Electrons running around wild are no good. Okay. So effectively, what we do is here's oxygen, and once we're eating, we bombard it with electrons. So most of the time, it picks. Remember, it's got, it's got a valence of two. Remember that periodic table up on the wall. Two. See, wants to gain two, not lose six. I practiced that in weight, he used to gain two pounds until he was six. So, you get, get O minus two, and it makes it's two protons from the proton motor force. What does it make? Water! And we can get rid of water. Periodically, it forms this. It's called superoxide radical. O2 with a minus sign. And that superoxide is nasty. It's a free radical. And free radicals are the basis of modern cancer, modern aging, various types of deterioration. They form when you are ill or sick. That's why we take antioxidant vitamins or eat superfoods that are rich in antioxidants. Okay? So we want to enhance our memory. These are our inherent antioxidants. The O2 minus in the presence of superoxide dismutase changes it to hydrogen peroxide, which is also a and then the catalase takes the H2O2 and turns it into water and oxygen gas. Put hydrogen peroxide, go to the drugstore, go to the giant eagle, put it on your intact skin, nothing. Put it on a cut, it bubbles. That's the test that you do. What happens is when you, anytime you have any type of damage to a cell, one of our cells, it releases the catalase and, it'll, and then that will trigger that reaction. We call it the catalase test. It'll trigger the, and it's why it works so well, why we use it for infection. And we use, you'll see it plays a big role when we start talking about sterilization and antiseptics. Because we're for, we have a, we create an abundance of oxygen rapidly, and most bacteria can't survive large amounts of oxygen very rapidly. Peroxide's a very useful agent and biologically degradable. So if you're looking for green things from a disinfectant, Peroxide's in that can. 
And vacuoles, I didn't mean to give it short shift, are like just storage for the most part. Uh, mitochondria. See, so this is the one that's originally from the endosymbiotic tree. Circular DNA, 70S ribosomes, a big problem with antibiotics that target protein synthesis because they're 70S ribosomes in us. It has this elaborate membrane system inside, all folded, that increases surface area. It has its own DNA, so it can make more or doesn't have to make more stuff, depending on circumstances. And it has a lot of ribosomes because all those proteins are what make something that you may or may not have spent some time but probably touched on called the Krebs cycle. Okay, which is how we do most of our energy transformation. So the, the distinction in plant algae is basically a microscopic plant, single or multicellular, photosynthetic. That's also endosymbiotic because it's probably from a pigmented bacteria. Those pigments absorb energy from sunlight and are able to can utilize that energy to effectively staple carbon together, carbon dioxide, inorganic carbon. We call carbon fixation. Again, fixing it means not to repair it, but to affix it, <coughs> to staple it together to make carbohydrates. And then from that, are the basic building blocks for proteins, the basic building blocks for amino acids. Fungi in the ground and yeasts, they release nitrogen that's in those organic compounds. They get reincorporated into carbon compounds like I was describing, let's say plant debris. Now all of a sudden you have the nitrogen you need for amino acids and for nucleotide bases. So, I mean, and that's called fixing nitrogen. So they, they, it's all together, ecologically speaking, it's together. So, in the meantime, when it does this, it gives off oxygen gas. It takes carbon dioxide and water in the presence of this is photosynthesis. It takes carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light energy and chlorophyll. We get carbohydrates and oxygen gas. What a country. Hug a plant today. Ugh. I, and ribosomes, and we're not going to go chapter and verse. In eukaryotic cells, they're ADS, so they have a greater density than the smaller ones in the mitochondria, which are 70S, or in bacteria. But the similarities are still present that are there. They have a cytoskeleton. Again, these are things we don't see anything this elaborate in prokarya or in bacteria. So we have actin filaments are made out of repeat units called actin. You should remember those from actin and myosin and muscle. Intermediate filaments, which are tetramers. It's like taking strands of protein, four of them, and braiding them together. Because braiding gives you strength. And then lastly, the microtubules. You saw that nine plus two before. And you can look at the charts just as well as I can. This is the endosymbiotic idea. You had some common ancestor that likely was invaded by some type of virus, in this case, DNA virus, that created the DNA in the cell. And depending on the nature of the DNA, it was archaea or bacteria. And then some of the bacterial DNA entered another precursor cell and got incorporated. And now magically we have membrane boundary. That's the, the idea. And you can see it's a, a long process that took at least by traditional carbon dating mechanisms and however they figure out how old the planet is. Because despite what you think, I was not there. We have a little bit to do on yeast and we're done. Yeast and fungi are in the same family. So you have yeast and mold, which are more microscopic, and fungi, mushrooms, okay, which are macroscopic. And yeasts are what they call dimorphic. And this is part of the problem. The, the ones that are bad for us are dimorphic. They start as yeasts, which are pretty innocent and tiny. And then when they form hyphal strands, long chains of these, which you don't see so much in yeast, but you see in other dimorphic fungi, what happens is they can really become a problem internally, particularly in your lungs. 
And we start talking about respiratory diseases. Folks who live in the southwestern United States, very dry, arid conditions, all have to be concerned about something called valley fever, which originally was San Joaquin Valley fever. But any of these, and it affects you and I, it affects animals. You live, I, my brother-in-law lives in Tucson, retired there. He has had a dog that's died of valley fever. You know, so it's not, and people are very well aware of it. Thankfully, there is better treatment today. So there's something you're very aware of. It's a lung disease. They're inhaling these fun microscopic fungal elements. So make no mistake, it's a big deal. The origin of AIDS, in the sense, the definition of AIDS came from, because normally our bodies get rid of that fairly easily. But when your immune system is suppressed, so there's just such an abundance in the Southwest, it's more, it's worse for immune suppressed people. The first paper on AIDS, which was released in 1981 in San Francisco, a doctor there had a lot of gay male patients who were suffering from an unusual respiratory illness called PCP pneumonia, which was a fungal pneumonia from something called pneumocystic, uh, a pneumocystic kind of pneumonia. And the pneumocyst was a fungus that had impaired their lungs. And he saw companionly that all of their immune systems were depressed because he never saw it in healthy people, just in this limited population. And then further testing revealed a common virus that they determined was human immunodeficiency virus. And now the idea that AIDS was when developed when their immune systems effectively collapsed, which is exactly the truth. We were seeing that, and I'll give you the story when we do viruses. When I was a resident and a student in Philadelphia, five, six years before that publishing, so was he. Okay, we were seeing AIDS. I had lunch on more than one occasion because our downstairs neighbor, my first wife and I, was a gay male in a society where they, they kept fairly closeted together. It wasn't accepted. Okay, different world now. But understand, I mean, we would sit there. And, and the guy would leave and he'd go, boy, it's really sad. He's got it. We didn't know what it was. It was AIDS. As you could see, all the changes that were happening. Fascinating. So that's what dimorphic means. And we characterize them, as you will in the lab, based on things like the arrangement of these hyphae, these microscopes, or on a plate in the lab, when you start to plate out things, maybe if you took some samples in the room, some of them maybe have mold growing. Bacteria are fairly flat. Mold kind of heaps up that are there. So there's a lot of human diseases, and environmental diseases, hospital-based diseases, and that AIDS, the idea of HIV and the subsequent AIDS are called opportunistic inf infections. Sometimes there are things that normally wouldn't infect somebody because their immune system is common. And we'll talk about what are called AIDS-defining illnesses. Okay, so the AIDS pain, patient, harmless spores, cell walls, we know trigger allergies, mushrooms, if you don't know what you're doing, don't pick them. Aspergillosis, I've seen this in cheap dorm rooms, not here, obviously, but in places where a lot of college students went to cheap living places, they'd have concrete floors, Carpet would get wet, spilled on. They wouldn't replace it when somebody new moved in. Black mold would grow under it. People were getting sick. Aspergillus. Okay, so there's a lot of these, and, and it, there's a lot that's involved. Fungi again decompose, release nitrogen. They release enzymes. They're called exodigesters. They release enzymes, break break apart dead stuff and dying stuff, and they play, and they're extraordinarily important. Antibiotics, alcohol, making various types of organic acids that we use commonly in life. Vitamins, for instance, all of this, and, and certainly inherently food groups as well. We'll talk about these, they're by definition a saprobe, move off of dead stuff. Parasites occupy and live in living things, but hurt them. And heterotrophs are what you and I are with regard to food. We eat basically everything. So whether you're a vegetarian, a vegan, or an omnivore, whether you're a pescatarian, or you just eat anything, it doesn't matter. You're still a heterotroph. You eat a variety of different things and get your carbon compounds and your energy 
from breaking those down. Uh, not a big deal. This is most lab. Spores are the way they reproduce. Spores can be in a problem. Okay, and you look at that in the lab, different kinds of them. Fungi can even do sexual and asexual. And we'll, remind me, we'll start with protozoan here. I basically got through some of this with the other group. But I'll try to make a mental note to start there on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.